So why does it matter? I want to talk a little bit about kind of these subjects. The subject of cross addiction, which is you may start out addicted to one substance and suddenly switch to addiction to another substance. Same thing with processes. Reactivation of craving and addiction and substance-induced versus underlying psychiatric disorders and the development of treatments. I show this slide in every presentation because this was my life for so many years and it still is very, very close to my heart. And that is that today we're focusing on addiction. We're focusing on the tip of the spectrum. Addiction is people who use substances despite devastating consequences in their life they crave those substances in a way that's very difficult to understand, and they've lost complete control of the use of the substance. They make promises, they break. And that is a neurobiologic disorder, and that's what we're focusing on. But there are a number of people in this uh, country who use substances in a less than dependent way. And most of that has to do with environmental and behavioral issues. I'm not going to say that the neurochemistry is unimportant, because it is important. It may be that the people who fall in this range, their genetic makeup actually protects them from the development of the more severe disorder. That's one possibility. One possibility is that they simply haven't made it to the more severe disorder yet. So they're in that process of laying down pathways in their brain, but the pathways are not well-worn roads. They're just sort of suggestions. So we're talking about these folks, the folks that have a disease. A disease and the primary diseased part of the body is the brain. We're going to look at some dopamine pathways. So Dopamine is made in many places, but one of the central places in which dopamine is made is the nucleus accumbens. And once it's made in the nucleus accumbens, signals can send dopamine to a variety of areas. It can send uh, dopamine to areas that are responsible for learning and memory, like the hippocampus. It can send dopamine to areas of the brain which are responsible for weighing pros and cons, like the frontal cortex. So your brain, in the most basic of terms, my apologies to the scientists, but we're, I'm going to make this as basic as it can be. Your brain has its more sort of instinctual, animalistic, older part. And it has its newer, sort of more logical, judgment-oriented part. And that newer part is here in the front. And that older part is more in the middle and the back. One of the challenges is that the older part of the brain is sometimes faster and stronger than the newer part of the brain. And if you think about um, people who are starting to use substances when they are 10, 11, 12, we really have a challenge. Because as some of you may know, Adolescence is all about you know, developing that frontal part, that ability to weigh pros and cons. And once you've weighed the pros and cons, to make the right decision. But if by using drugs, what you do is just strengthen this animalistic, instinctive part of the brain, this reward pathway, this instinctual part, then it's really hard to get better because that part of the brain that you needed to help stop is not well developed. So as I was saying earlier, you know, I treat primarily young adults and adults. But I work with a lot of 20-year-olds who are in a 12-year-old brain because they started using substances before they could surmount some of the brain challenges of adolescence. We talked about reward, which is one of the most important things dopamine does. But it also has to do with how do you make decisions. It has to do with how often you repeat something or how much compulsion you have to do a certain 
uh, action. It has something to do actually with motor function and how well you can use your fingers. So when you think about people who have drug problems and are recovering from drug problems, not only do we have issues associated with their sense of what's good and bad, we have problems associated with their ability to uh, use fine motor skills. We have uh, problems associated with them to uh, making decisions in other domains of their life. So serotonin. We're going to talk about serotonin primarily in terms of its relationship to the hippocampus and its importance in learning and memory. When we show this slide to people who are in treatment, this is part of how we help explain they go through that acute detoxification period where we'll take alcohol for an example because it's what most people are the most familiar with. And they might be you know, very shaky, they might hallucinate, they might have a seizure and just about everybody could recognize that as, oh yeah, that's alcohol withdrawal. And since that gets better, we have a tendency, and people who are even going through the process have a tendency to say, oh, I'm done with that. I'm done with the withdrawal process. But as it turns out, they're not done with the withdrawal process. And they come into my office and they say, I can't sleep. I can't remember my dog's name. I feel bad. I feel depressed. I feel anxious. I didn't feel this way before. And what they're experiencing still is that withdrawal, the fact that their serotonin pathways have not come back to normal. So they may have stopped using alcohol and we may have gotten them out of that period of shaking and hallucinating and um, uh, the, out of that risk of having a seizure, but the brain is still changing and they still can't sleep, can't remember, can't think, and they're their mood and their anxiety just seems to fluctuate either from day to day or from hour to hour. Um, and you know, the good news is that it gets better and better and better and better. But the important news is the brain changes slowly. Or if you're experiencing all those bad things, it sure seems like it's changing slowly. If you think about what has happened to their brain, then maybe it seems like it's happening really, really fast. And when I get to see somebody who comes into treatment and I get to see them you know, on a near daily basis and it's 30 days later and they look like a completely new person, to me that seems really fast. But when they're there at day 10, it seems so slow. So, you know, in the past, until Dr. Koop, I think, really made this um, very, this theory very popular and went on to sort of show the reasons and why his other way of looking at it is important. We thought people use drugs because drugs feel good. That made sense. You know, you used the drug and you felt happy or excited or focused or you could sleep or you just felt well. That must be why people use drugs. And the problem with continuing to think that is I think it feeds into this idea that people really could and should stop using on their own. I think when we understand that some of the drive that keeps someone going from using is that not using drugs feels bad, that it helps us understand maybe a little bit better what someone's going through. So when you use drugs, your dopamine might go up, either your opiates might go up or your sense that there are lots of opiates might go up if you're supplementing them, your serotonin goes up, your GABA goes up, and that's happiness, sense of well-being, ability to sleep, lack of anxiety. The problem is that once you've been through a couple of these cycles of using substances and your brain's changed to adapt to these substances being around and you suddenly yank the substances away, then some bad things are happening. So suddenly you've gone from having all this dopamine that felt good to not having any at all. Your brain ran out of gas. You go from having all of these opiates 
that not only made you feel good, but relieved pain to not having any opiates at all. So what this means, we have certainly uh, uh, what feels like an epidemic of prescription drug misuse of opiates. Some of that's just from kids getting, out of, uh, getting it out of their parents' cabinets or getting it you know, from others, but some of that is from pain clinics. You know, Go to the doctor, my back hurts. It's one of the most common reasons why Americans visit the doctor. And the doctor gives them some hydrocodone, as is in uh, Vicodin, and their back feels better. It relieves the pain. It tells the body, hey, we got plenty of opiates. Well, when you stop using the hydrocodone, if you've used it for a while, suddenly the body says, we don't make opiates anymore. We shut that factory down. We didn't need to. You gave us all the opiates we needed, so why have an opiate factory if we don't need it? Well, if you really do have legitimate pain from some source, and you have no internal opiate factory, that's a problem. So someone comes into treatment, they've gotten into lots of trouble with their medication, and we take it off them, and suddenly they hurt. And one of the analogies I use, let's see, anyone got a pen? <laughs> I say to them, if I do this, it's annoying. But if I come over there and I do that to somebody who is 10 days off opiates, it hurts. And it's not because they're making that up. Like, it is all in their brain, but it's not all in their head. They didn't just make that up from nothing. It hurts because they don't have any natural opiates that suppresses it from hurting. So someone who started on opiates because they were in pain, who has to be, come off of opiates because they are addicted and they're having those consequences and loss of control and craving, suddenly in that first six months of being off opiates, everything hurts and it's real. And when you think about them trying to make that decision to come into treatment or that decision to stop using opiates, and this is true for people who use heroin as well, well, the process of not using is physically and emotionally extremely painful. So serotonin, if serotonin is responsible in part for us not being depressed and being less anxious or being able to handle the events in our lives which seem to create feelings of depression and anxiety, and you're using substances that artificially boosted serotonin, and you suddenly take them away. Again, you have your serotonin factories. They're not up to snuff. There aren't as many of them. You have a decrease in the amount of serotonin, and suddenly you, know, you don't handle stress as well. Even the smallest comments seem really hurtful, your mood is not as good, you don't want to get up and go to work in the morning. And so, again, imagine that person who is using, who wants to quit, but what they experience is pain, unable to get out of the bed in the morning, don't feel well, can't handle stress. And then GABA. The way I usually explain GABA is, imagine GABA as this huge comforter, and you're just feeling all good and warm and cozy in your comforter, and then you suddenly yank it away. What happens? You shiver, and you feel uh, cold, and there's also usually some emotional reaction that goes with having your nice, warm comforter taken away. People who for example, come into treatment and alcohol or benzodiazepines, which is like Xanax, Valium, uh, Clonopin, who have been giving their body extra GABA from the outside, who suddenly have their blanket taken away, that is ex an experience of incredible discomfort. And it's not just an emotional discomfort, they actually really do have tremors or they have feelings of shooting sensations through their bodies. There's a physical component to it as well. And, and so what I hope you've come away from the last few minutes with is that 
the drive that keeps addiction going is in part related to how good the drug feels or how good the brain tells you the drug is, but it's also in large part related to how bad the brain and the body feel when the drug is no longer available. And that especially impacts someone's decision to get help because they maybe want to stop, but that state is so unpleasant that they don't even bother to seek out treatment. These are just some pictures they are in your handout and probably a little clearer in your handout that look at the relative reward associated with different substances. And one of the things it points out is that the relative reward associated with amphetamine is much faster and stronger than the relative reward associated even with cocaine, which is another stimulant, or with nicotine, which is the most common addiction worldwide, or even with alcohol. And it is this dopamine spike that in part is related to how many times one has to use a substance before they develop dependence. 